Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, a deep dive into the eyes of non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis, sponsored by Zambone USA LTD. Before we begin, I'd like to familiarize you with details of today's event. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions directly into the questions pane of the control panel. You may submit your questions at any time during the presentations. These will be collected throughout the program and addressed during the question and answer session at the end of the second presentation. I would now like to introduce our distinguished faculty for the program. Professor James Chalmers of the University of Dundee in Scotland, UK, and Professor Francesco Blasi of the University of Milan in Milan, Italy. Professor Chalmers. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to uh, the ATS for inviting me to speak at this webinar um, and to speak about this very important topic of uh, non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, forgive me, just getting the slides up for you now. Um, I've been given this really important setting the scene really around the diagnosis and characterization of the disease. So we're going to be talking about bronchiectasis severity and particularly why Pseudomonas aeruginosa is so important uh, when we're thinking about the management of bronchiectasis. Before we begin, these are my disclosures. So I do a number of research studies and consultancies with pharmaceutical companies in the field of bronchiectasis, <coughs> and they're shown here on the slide. So as I say, my goal here is to really set the scene and to talk about what are the important factors we need to think about clinically. And to set the scene, we need to think about what we're talking about, which is bronchiectasis. This is fundamentally an inflammatory disease. So we get permanent dilatation of the airways because of a combination of neutrophil-driven inflammation, uh, mucous gland hyperplasia and metaplasia, which causes the airways to be blocked with mucus. And as a result, we get impaired clearance of bacteria and chronic bacterial infection. For the patients, this means sputum production and cough, but also dyspnea chest discomfort, and frequent respiratory exacerbations that also drive the progression of the disease. So in combination, this is the clinical syndrome that we call bronchiectasis. And I emphasize this point around the clinical syndrome because uh, this is also a diagnosis that we make by imaging. And on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see the typical imaging features of bronchiectasis with dil dilatation of the airways, with the bronchus larger than the adjacent vessel, uh, the signet ring sign, uh, and other features that make the, the radiological diagnosis of bronchiectasis. Uh, but the, in order to have the disease that we call, call bronchiectasis, you also need the clinical syndrome, which includes cough, sputum production, and those infections. The Fleischner Society criteria for diagnosing bronchiectasis includes the dilation of the airways, the lack of normal tapering of those airways, or, and or the visible airways within one centimeter of the pleural surface. Now, this is a very heterogeneous disease. Although most, most patients will present with that typical syndrome, patients can present in a myriad of different ways uh, and to different specialists. And so a high index of suspicion is needed, as well as a tailored approach to treatment. And I'll return to that concept of personalized medicine as we go through the presentation. It's also important to be aware of the kinds of patients that we see in different geographical regions. Uh, there are a number of causes of bronchiectasis. In about 50% of cases, we don't identify the cause. Post-infectious, so as a result of a severe infection, is probably the most common etiology. But there are over 100 conditions that can cause bronchiectasis. And depending on where you are in the world, uh, the, co uh, the commonest etiology may be different. So, for example, where I am in the UK, idiopathic and post-infectious disease dominates the syndrome, but we also see a lot of patients with, for example, ABPA. ABPA is much less common in Southern Europe. Tuberculosis is a really common cause of bronchiectasis uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, in Asia, and in other parts of the world. Uh, and so, and in the United States and some parts of Asia, non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection is much more common than it is in my uh, clinical setting. 
And so that's a really important consideration. The disease is heterogeneous also between different geographies. Different underlying causes of the disease can present in different ways. Uh, and we call these phenotypes or subtypes of the disease. Uh, and I've given some examples on this slide. So the, idiop the classic idiopathic bronchiectasis presentation is a female in their 60s with often lower lobe disease, uh, often without an obvious history uh, of comorbidities or anything that would predispose to the condition. Whereas the presentation of, for example, primary ciliary dyskinesia at the bottom middle part of this slide is completely different. Usually a disease that starts in early life affects the lower and middle lobes and is associated with extra pulmonary features, particularly otitis media and rhinosinusitis, but in about 50% of cases also dextrocardia. ABPA often presents differently. That will be patients with a history of asthma, central bronchiectasis, uh, and different microbiology, staphylococcus infection being more common in that uh, TH2-driven disease. So I won't go through each of these phenotypes, but it's really important to consider uh, when you first see a patient with bronchiectasis, the question, why has my patient got bronchiectasis? And do they have any of these predisposing conditions? Uh, because they all influence management. Immunodeficiency can be treated with immunoglobulin replacement. Inflammatory bowel disease is often steroid responsive. NTM infection is treated with antibiotics. ABPA is treated with uh, anti-inflammatory uh, steroids plus antifungal. So the management is very different depending on the predisposing condition. I mentioned at the beginning that this is an inflammatory disease, and I think that's really important because uh, we're entering an era where we need to think about personalizing therapy and the types of inflammation can help us to personalize therapy. The majority of patients with bronchiectasis have neutrophilic disease, and the main driver of neutrophil recruitment to the airways is pathogens like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, and that sets up this concept of the vicious cycle, or we now think about the vicious vortex, where uh, patients can enter this cycle or vortex at any point. So they can maybe enter through infection in post-infectious disease or at the ciliary dysfunction part in primary cilius kinesia. But once the disease is established, patients can have uh, inflammation that then drives susceptibility to infection through impaired clearance of bacteria, and the combination of both of those things causes lung destruction, which further impairs the host defenses and round and round the cycle goes. And the reason why we emphasize that these are all dependent on each other is because some patients with bronchiectasis don't have obvious infection, but they can still have disease progression because of the effects of inflammatory cells on, on destroying the airways. Um, and so patients don't have to have all four components, but when they're all present, uh, the disease progresses most rapidly. One of the characteristic features of the disease is the production of purulent sputum. And so it's good to stop for a minute and consider what is purulent sputum? What's sputum made of? Um, we've done studies using proteomics, a technology that can profile all the, all the proteins in a sample to characterize what's in the sputum of patients with severe disease. And in most cases, in the red is the severe patients. The proteins on the left-hand side that drive that are neutrophil proteins. And what we uh, recognize in clinical practice is that we see neutrophils, the inflammation that's caused by neutrophils, uh, on a daily basis because they contain a green protein called myeloperoxidase that turns the sputum green. Many of your patients will tell you that when they get an exacerbation, they get uh, purulent sputum. That's an increase in inflammation causing the sputum to be green. Now, what drives that increase in inflammation? In the vast majority of cases, that's bacterial infection, that's bacteria. Uh, and so we have a number of challenges here uh, in the management of bronchiectasis. This is a disease that's increasing in prevalence. Uh, the most recent estimates of prevalence are that it's increased by more than 40% in the last 10 years. We have an absence of standardized definitions and diagnosis, and it's a really heterogeneous disease, which means it's easy to miss. You need a high index of suspicion. And as a result, many patients experience delayed diagnosis. Uh, patients present to different specialists and therefore uh, can be missed or can fall between the cracks of our established patient pathways. We have no treatments for the disease. Uh, and the most dangerous of the pathogens that we see in terms of that driving that inflammation is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 
But we lack good tools to monitor, to diagnose that uh, organism and indeed to treat it. And so we urgently need treatments that can reduce exacerbation frequency and particularly that can tackle pseudomonas. And I'm going to devote the last uh, section of this presentation to really thinking about the problem of, of pseudomonas and severe disease. So those patients that have the most severe disease have the most inflammation, the worst mucosillary clearance, and are the most likely to be infected with pathogens. As a result, these patients also have to take a large number of treatments, often inhaled treatments, airway clearance treatments, antibiotics. As a result, they have a substantial burden, so they, patients spend a lot of time on their treatments. Uh, and so it's very important when we're thinking about how we manage patients, particularly with severe bronchiectasis, that we use this kind of precision medicine approach because it allows us to streamline therapy to give the right treatment to the right patient at the right time and also only to give patients treatment that's going to provide them with benefit. So that also means we need accurate severity assessment. You need to be able to identify those patients that are most severe. And one of the tools that we have that's been validated by clinical research is the bronchiectasis severity index. So this was developed in 2014 by a European network of investigators, and it classifies the severity of bronchiectasis uh, using a multidimensional score. And you can see here that it includes age, body mass index, FEV1, hospital admissions for bronchiectasis, exacerbations, breathlessness, pseudomonas infection, infection with other organisms, and radiological severity. These are all of the aspects that feed into uh, our clinical assessment of a patient with severe bronchiectasis. All of these individual factors are associated with either the risk of mortality or the risk of having severe exacerbations, which are two key endpoints in this patient population. The two probably most important components of this index, because they can be treated, are exacerbations and infection, because we can prevent exacerbations and we can treat infection. So what's the impact of exacerbations? Why is it so important to try and prevent exacerbations? So the reason that this is so important is these are, uh, if you ask a patient, what's the thing that impacts your quality of life the most? They will say the daily cost of sputum production and the exacerbations. But exacerbations are important for another reason. It's because they drive disease progression. This is from a really nice study that I, I think is one of the best into exacerbations in bronchiectasis. They use diaries to monitor uh, the symptoms from onset of symptoms to the diagnosis of exacerbation, which is the big line at the zero, showing that patients can have symptoms for up to, up to two weeks before a diagnosis of an exacerbation is made. But then monitoring the symptoms as the exacerbation resolves. And you can see around a third of patients still have symptoms beyond two weeks. And some patients never return to baseline, even after a month. And this I recognize in my practice that some patients will come to you in clinic and say, I've never been the same since that exacerbation. I've never got back to normal. Uh, and so the only way to prevent disease from progressing and patients getting to that stage is to prevent the exacerbations in the first place. Now, the reason exacerbations are so prominent in the bronchiectasis severity index is that they are associated with other key clinical outcomes. One of those is hospitalizations, which obviously cost the health system a lot of money. Patients who have three or more exacerbations per year in this uh, European study had a 40% probability of being hospitalized for a severe exacerbation during follow-up. That is really important. You don't want patients to be at risk of being admitted to hospital for severe events. But even more important, patients who had frequent exacerbations were significantly more likely to, to die during follow-up. So they had an increased mortality. Now, mortality increases for each exacerbation, as you can see from the Kaplan-Meier curve here, but particularly that frequent exacerbated phenotype, the ones with three or more events per year, were at significantly increased risk. Um, and so this, again, emphasizes the importance of thinking about the prevention of exacerbations. I think in the past we dismissed exacerbations, and um, certainly patients say that uh, it's often dismissed as, ah, you get a couple of chest infections during the winter, it's not anything to worry about. This data tells you that it is something to worry about, that exacerbations are important events in the life of patients, and they need to be prevented. So 
The other aspect that is absolutely critical because it's treatable within the bronchitis severity index is colonization with pseudomonas. And everything I've said up until this point builds to emphasize the importance of pseudomonas. It's the major driver of inflammation. It's one of the most common pathogens that we see, if not the most common pathogen that we see. And it's a major risk factor for exacerbations. So everything comes together when we're thinking about the patient with pseudomonas. Uh, the patient that grows pseudomonas uh, has all of these major problems to deal with. What's the evidence for that? Well, going back to the original study that derived the bronchitis severity index, uh, those patients all had sputum cultures performed. And when you classify patients by their sputum microbiology, you see pseudomonas standing out here like a skyscraper on the left-hand side, clearly different from the other pathogens that are identified in sputum as being associated with a much higher risk of hospitalization. That's because it causes more severe exacerbations, but also because it's multidrug resistant and often requires intravenous therapy uh, due to it, uh, inability to treat with oral antibiotics. And you can also see on the right-hand side that pseudomonas, along with other gram-negative pathogens, is the organism associated with the greatest risk of mortality. Uh, and that mortality in the vast majority of cases is respiratory related mortality. It's due to progression of bronchiectasis. So pseudomonas is undoubtedly a poor prognostic factor in bronchiectasis. Uh, and when we look not just at that one study, which is the, the study from the bronchiectasis severity index, but all of the studies that looked at this in a meta-analysis of eight studies, the estimate was that pseudomonas increases the risk of death by threefold and increases the risk of hospitalization by almost sevenfold compared to not being infected with pseudomonas. Patients with pseudomonas also had worse disease in general, worse lung function, more frequent exacerbations, and worse quality of life. And importantly, when we look at those markers of airway, airway inflammation, they're also much higher in people with pseudomonas, explaining why we see that worth prognosis. It's a major driver of the, the severity and the inflammation of the disease. Now, can we put this in some sort of context? How important is this? Well, if you take a population of patients with bronchitis and pseudomonas, the airways are constantly inflamed by the presence of the bacteria. They're producing lots of purulent sputum that really impairs quality of life, not just because of the effort of constantly producing that sputum, uh, but also the social impacts of that. Patients don't want to go out because they're producing this horrible mucus. They don't want to, to be seen doing that. And so using quality of life tools, such as the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire that's used across multiple respiratory diseases, we can do a kind of comparison of how bad is it to have bronchiectasis and pseudomonas. Uh, and this is what we've produced. So if you take studies of severe asthma, severe COPD, IPF, all of which are groups of patients we would accept have a really severe impairment of quality of life. You get SGRQ scores between 40 and 50, and that is, those are really bad scores. In that study that I showed you, uh, which was the, the study with, uh, from the UK of the bronchiectasis severity index, the score for pseudomonas infected patients is almost 60. So this appears to impair quality of life more so than even some of the most severe risk diseases out there. So this again emphasizes why this patient population in particular is one we need to uh, manage and manage aggressively. How do patients come to being chronically infected with pseudomonas? Well, this I think is really important. Pseudomonas is an environmental organism, so we're exposed to it regularly through our lives. And our, our host defenses, our inflammatory pathways, and our mucosillary clearance gets rid of pseudomonas in the majority of cases. But if you have bronchiectasis, you're susceptible to that organism finding its way into the lower airway and establishing infection. And that is probably initially starts uh, as mucosillary clearance gets worse as the disease progresses with an initial infection that your body is able to clear, uh, but perhaps not clear completely. And so you end up with a low level infection and pseudomonas, as many of you all know, is able to form biofilms and uh, achieve an infection that ultimately is very difficult to clear. Once those, that sort of biofilm associated infection is established, it's probably impossible to get rid of the organism with the current antibiotics we have. And so we have an opportunity in early disease to try and prevent the establishment of chronic infection. And that's what we talk about in terms of eradication therapy. Uh, 
So patients that first grow Pseudomonas, having never grown it in the past, may be eligible according to the 2017 European bronchiectasis guidelines for eradication treatment that includes systemic and inhaled antibiotics. We now have a consensus definition of chronic infection, um, which is shown on the right-hand side of this slide, which is repeated isolates of the same organism over time, separated by at least three months to show that it's chronic. In those patients, it's unlikely we're going to be able to eradicate the pathogen, but we need to think about suppressing the bacterial load because we need a way to reduce that inflammation in the airways that Pseudomonas uh, causes. Uh, and I've shown you all of the reasons why it's important to at least suppress Pseudomonas because of its association with worse mortality, it's associated with more inflammation and more symptoms, and its association with disease progression. So in summary, bronchiectasis is a heterogeneous clinical syndrome. It's a neglected disease that needs more attention. Some of our priorities for the next a uh, few years, I think, are achieving an earlier diagnosis in order to institute therapy to hopefully prevent the progression of disease that I've talked about. To emphasize more about identifying the underlying causes, idiopathic bronchiectasis uh, is 50 to 60% of cases in clinical practice, but it should be much lower than that if we can achieve standardized testing for underlying causes. We can only find pseudomonas if we do regular sputum cultures. Uh, and identifying Pseudomonas earlier gives us that opportunity to eradicate and avoid long-term infection. Professor Blasey will talk more about treatment, but physiotherapy and airway clearance are fundamental because that's the problem that most of our patients have. Uh, and multidisciplinary care best uh, delivered in specialist clinics is what we should be aiming for, just like we have for cystic fibrosis. On the other side of this is that in patients with established bronchiectasis, it's important that we think about phenotypes and endotypes. So that's groups of patients that need more aggressive treatment. And one of the most important, if not the most important clinical phenotype are patients with pseudomonas infection. They have greater severity, more inflammation, worse symptoms, increased mortality. And by recognizing them, by doing the sputum cultures, identifying that patients have chronic infection, we can institute aggressive treatment that hopefully can improve outcomes for this very difficult group of patients. So with that, um, I will thank you for uh, attending this webinar uh, and pass over to Professor Blasey for the, the second presentation. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Oh, try to, okay, here we are. So, uh... My, my task today is just to give you some uh, insights on the management of severe uh, bronchiectasis and give you the, the very last uh, strategies for, for treatment. Uh, these are my disclosure. As for Professor Chalmers, I work for many, many companies working on, on bronchiectasis. And one of the point is that there are a, a number of recommendations and uh, guidelines uh, on the standard of care in bronchiectasis. Most of them are characterized to be uh, uh, consensus about the expert. Uh, this is the uh, British Thoracic Society guidelines uh, published uh, some years ago. Uh, it, it, the, the guidelines is divided in different steps, uh, starting with uh, the first point, treat underlying cause. This is quite interesting uh, because uh, you know very well that in about, uh, as Professor Chalmers said, about from 40 to 60 percent of uh, our bronchiectasis patients are classified as idiopathic, so there is no clear underlying cause. But we have to, to work a lot on, on trying to identify underlying causes. And then uh, I, I, I raise clearance and pulmonary rehabilitation are very important. The BTS guidelines said, well, annual influenza vaccination is important and treating uh, exacerbation as soon as possible is also important as for discussing with the patient a self-management plan uh, in, in a way that the patient can work immediately on his own uh, health. The other point is uh, exacerbation. As uh, uh, highlighted by Professor Chalmers, exacerbation are one of the main points in bronchiectasis. 
uh, for prognosis, mortality, and morbidity. And certainly, if you have three or more exacerbation uh, per year, uh, you need an intervention. And the first intervention uh, should be reassessment of physiotherapy, but is the main uh, step for uh, management of bronchiectasis. And you can consider mucoactive treatment. If you go uh, to the step three, uh, if the uh, patient has still uh, a number of exacerbation, then you have to uh, uh, define the role of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, we highlighted already that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is one of the main players in exacerbation of adults in chronic infection in our patient. So long-term inhaled antibiotic, anti pseudomonas antibiotic may be important, or uh, long-term macrolide as a suppressive therapy for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And uh, if there are other pathogenic macro, uh, microorganisms like Haemophilus influenza, uh, uh, you can use long-term macrolide. And uh, macrolide are uh, indicated also if you have no pathogen identified. Uh, and then if you have a, a steel exacerbation, you can combine macrolide and long-term antibiotic. And uh, if you go uh, to five or more exacerbation, then you can consider regular intravenous antibiotic. Uh, these are the uh, stepwise uh, approach of the uh, European guidelines, the ERS guidelines. And uh, uh, the, the first point is always the same, is pulmonary rehabilitation. Again, pulmonary rehabilitation is, is the, the first and the most important uh, intervention for our patients. And uh, clearly controlling the impaired mucosivary clearance uh, improving airway clearance and e eventually using mucoactive treatments. And the other point, again, are, bronchiet are exacerbation and chronic bacterial bronchial infection. So the possibility to, uh, to have long-term inhaled or, or antibiotic therapy, mainly macrolide, antibiotic for exacerbation. And the other point is to try to eradicate Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And I'll discuss with you uh, about this kind of eradication we propose for uh, uh, how to uh, deal with pseudomonas eradication. And then the other point is inflammation. Uh, I will discuss with you the, the role of uh, inhaled steroids, the role of new anti-inflammatory therapies uh, that and try to identify the uh, subset of patient where you can use uh, the different uh, drugs. This is a perspective that uh, Professor Chalmers, uh, Professor Aliberti, and myself uh, published some years ago in uh, ERJ on the general management of bronchiectasis. And again, uh, the main problem are uh, general management of uh, 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 using vaccination. And we uh, stress also the, the need to uh, vaccinate against pneumococcus, not only influenza, managing the comorbidities and the underlying cause, pulmonary rehabilitation, as usual, and prompt treatment or exacerbation. And we propose a sputum surveillance for Pseudomonas aeruginosa and for another important bug that are non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. I'll show you some important data on, on about non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. Uh, so clearly, severity is important, and there is a, a, a step up approach to uh, severity uh, using uh, uh, inhaled corticosteroid in selected patient, uh, going to macrolide, inhaled antibiotic, and certainly uh, regular physiotherapy. Exacerbation, we already highlighted how important are acute exacerbation. And uh, clearly, uh, BSI score is uh, uh, important, uh, and uh, the Easter exacerbation are predictors of further occurrence of uh, exacerbation. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa has been already highlighted by, by Professor Chalmers, how important is the chronic infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa in terms of number of exacerbation and mortality. And uh, clearly, uh, uh, exacerbation are associated with significant morbidity and the prevention of exacerbation is, is a crucial role and a crucial goal for uh, management of bronchiectasis. Uh, I must say that most of what we are saying about Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection in bronchiectasis are related to what we know in cystic fibrosis. Uh, 
Uh, we know that in cystic fibrosis, we know that early infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa is associated with the worse outcomes. And uh, the same is for bronchiectasis. Infection with Pseudomonas is associated with worse outcomes. We know that in cystic fibrosis, eradication of Pseudomonas aeruginosa can improve pulmonary function and can reduce hospitalization. And we know in bronchiectasis, the, the uh, evidence are a little bit less, but eradication may be associated with improvement in, in some patients. And in cystic fibrosis, uh, all the patients are regular, regularly screened for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, whereas in, uh, in, in uh, uh, bronchiectasis, not all the patients are uh, screened. And one of the proposals of this statement, uh, Professor Charles and I uh, wrote for the uh, ERJ, said that it's important to take into account the possibility that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is there and gave a chronic infection. Uh, what about treatment of Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection? We have only a few clinical studies. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea is that uh, bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis has some uh, uh, similarity. And so uh, what has been used in cystic fibrosis has been applied also in bronchiectasis. But what the, the, some of, many of these studies really uh, were not uh, uh, satisfactory in terms of uh, eradication, in terms of reduction of exacerbation. So still a lot of work to do. What does the guideline suggest? These are the ERS guidelines saying that, well, if you have a first or new isolation of pseudomonas aeruginosa, you can try to eradicate. And how you can try to eradicate? The proposal uh, is uh, a free harm proposal. Uh, without any real preference. The first one is to start with orofluoropinolone and then going to intravenous antibiotic, inhaled antibiotic for a total duration of three months of treatment. The second arm is intravenous antibiotic uh, followed by inhaled antibiotic uh, for a total duration of three months. And uh, the, the third one is a combination of the two uh, having uh, inhaled antibiotics for a total duration of three months after two weeks of initial phase. So at the end of the day, we have a, 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 a three a proposal without any real evidence that one works better than the others. On the other, time, on the other uh, uh, hand, uh, long-term antibiotic treatment in uh, trying to uh, uh, reduce the burden of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the airways uh, sometimes has uh, some, some uh, uh, not satisfactory results. And uh, we have some inhaled antibiotics that can give some adverse events like wheezing, cough. And uh, we have also the fear of emergence of antibiotic resistance, is, even if the uh, use of inhaled antibiotic is not really associated with a clear emergence of antibiotic resistance. And this is related to the complexity of the disease. Uh, the, there are different uh, uh, causes, uh, as uh, highlighted by, by Professor Chalmers, from idiopathic to ABPR to NTM infection. Radiology may be different, and you, uh, you should uh, in, uh, interplay the, the uh, underlying disorders, radiology, microbiology, uh, giving you some clinical phenotypes like severe pseudomonas infection or chronic sputum producer. Uh, the type of inflammation is important. Most of our patients have a neutrophilic inflammation, but we know that about 20% of our patients, uh, at least in Europe, uh, have a neutrophilic inflammation with more than 300 cells per uh, microliters. And, uh, in this case, clearly the response could be, uh, the uh, approach could be different. Uh, from one side, you can use uh, antibiotic. From the other side, you can use uh, steroids, uh, particularly hinase steroids, when eosinophilic uh, inflammation is present. But certainly one of the point is that uh, all these uh, clinical phenotypes, endotypes of inflammation are in some way related to increased mortality, severity of exacerbation, and progressive lung function decline. So new approaches. Uh, we, we have a novel delivery methods for current antibiotics. We have new anti-inflammatory drugs like DPP-1, and I'll show you the results. 
uh, of a study. Uh, we have to improve mucociliary clearance uh, for CF, uh, CFTR modulators are now widely used with excellent results, but we know that in some cases of bronchiectasis, C CFTR modulation could be an option. Uh, we will see uh, if, if the, the, the next studies about this. Uh, certainly, uh, immunomodulatory drug can be uh, interesting, particularly neutrophil elastase inhibitors are important, or phosphodiesterase type 4 inhibitor could be important. For sure, if you have a deficit in vitamin D, vitamin D supplementation can be important. These are the data of a phase two trial of DPP-1 inhibitor bronsocatib, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the first name is Jen Chalmers. And uh, what happened is that the uh, time to first exacerbation was clearly uh, a significantly different uh, comparing the two dosage of bronsocatib compared to placebo. This is a quite interesting drug uh, that reduced the uh, uh, release by neutrophils uh, uh, of the uh, neutrophil elastase in the lung, uh, acting in the bone marrow, blocking the uh, 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 DPP-1, so uh, re reducing the, uh, uh, the load of uh, neutrophil uh, elastase in, in the uh, neutrophil without uh, an effect on the immune uh, response related to neutrophil. So it's quite interesting drug for uh, neutrophil uh, inflammation. And clearly the other point are the bacteria. Chronic infection is important uh, because it's related with exacerbation, it's related with inflammation and clinical symptoms, uh, mostly related to neutrophil mediated inflammation and uh, uh, so the importance of the uh, uh, vicious cycle as already highlighted by, by James Chalmers, is, it seems to be very important. In this case, antibiotic could be an, an option. These are the ERS guidelines. Um, uh, and uh, the idea is to use uh, in patients with more than three, ex uh, three exacerbation per year after optimizing for airway clearance and uh, treating the underlying disease Long-term inhaled antibiotic for pseudomonas aeruginosa is important, or long-term macrolide treatment can be used. Indeed, if you look to the single studies, unfortunately, most of them were unsatisfactory in terms of results and in terms of reaching the, uh, the primary outcome. However, putting all together in, a, in this uh, systematic review, at the end of the day, there is an effect uh, look into the different study with using fluoroquinolone, aminoglycoside, astreonam, and cholestine. At the end of the day, uh, there is a, a reduction in exacerbation of about uh, uh, from 16 to 19 percent. Uh, however, the study are highly heterogeneous, and uh, till now we don't have a clear indication for the efficacy of uh, inhaled antibiotics. This is one of the two studies I want to show you. Uh, this has been published recently in ERJ last year. Uh, this is a, a, a study funded by uh, EU Commission in the, in the, inside the program of uh, uh, IMI uh, using tobramycin uh, inhalation powered uh, for pseudomonas aeruginosa infected bronchiectasis patient. Uh, this is a quite interesting study where we use the a uh, different uh, uh, treatment course, uh, a different uh, concentrate uh, uh, dosage of a drug, uh, having a, a, a continuous treatment, an on-off treatment with different uh, uh, dosage of a drug from uh, <clears throat> till uh, four capsules twice daily. Uh, what are the results? Uh, the uh, outcome was uh, uh, density in sputum of pseudomonas aeruginosa. And indeed, what uh, uh, is uh, clear that the number, if you use a high, high dose in continuous treatment, the effect seems to be uh, better than using on-off or lower dose. However, this study was terminated before we reach the plan uh, number of patient, was terminated for different problems uh, in, in, the, in the company uh, funding the, the study. And at the end of the day, uh, we uh, have the, only the possibility to say that there is a reduction in pseudomonas aeruginosa load 
uh, probably higher in uh, when you use the higher dose and you go for continuous treatment, but clearly there is no data on uh, uh, clinical endpoints, particularly on pulmonary exacerbation, use of antibiotic and hospitalization. Uh, the last study I want to show you is the PROMISE one. Uh, this is a phase three trial um, uh, that has been presented at ATS and the ERS uh, Congresses in the last year is a, a month multinational randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial uh, using a, a colistin delivered by HINEP, that is a, a specific device, uh, inhalation device, uh, in patients with bronchiectasis and chronic pseudomonas infection. Uh, the uh, uh, key inclusion criteria are what we expected for a study uh, looking for pseudomonas aeruginosa with high number of exacerbation and documented history of pseudomonas aeruginosa infection and positive sputum culture uh, during the, uh, the uh, screening period. The results are quite interesting. Uh, there is a reduction of about 40% of pulmonary exacerbation rate uh, uh, with a very significant result. And the same is for severe exacerbation rate with a reduction of about 60% of severe exacerbation. Uh, this is still, uh, again, highly resistant, high, highly significant. And this is uh, uh, even uh, if corrected with the macro lab use and, and country uh, where the study has been performed. The last point I want to talk at, at, uh, is uh, the, uh, the use of uh, the problem of microbiome in bronchiectasis. This is a paper we published recently in, the nat in Natural Medicine uh, looking to integrative microbiomics. Uh, we know that not only bacteria are involved in the airways, but we have also uh, fungi and virus. And sometimes you have to take in account the possible interaction between the, the, the three domain of uh, bacteria, fungi, and virus. And uh, putting uh, in, in the center of, of the game, as usual, and in the battlefield, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is clearly the main pathogen, uh, but uh, we uh, uh, identify uh, a different microbiota with different interaction between the, uh, the bacteria present in the airways and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and, and we uh, identify uh, two different uh, uh, kind of, of uh, patient with low exacerbation frequency, a high exacerbation frequency, and this is related to the interaction in between Pseudomonas aeruginosa and the other bacteria present in the, in the airways. So clearly the uh, interaction uh, and, uh, between uh, Pseudomonas and the other uh, the flora present in the airways may be important in defining high exacerbation frequency or low exacerbation frequency. And in fact, one of the part is that we have also to take in account the fungal microbiome, uh, for sure, Aspergillus is important, uh, is important because of for fungal, fungal sensitization, but also the effect as a pro inflammatory uh, uh, bugs. And clearly, this is maybe important in, uh, to be taken into account when you look to your patient. So, in conclusion, uh, uh, clearly, the disease is uh, 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 a clinical heterogeneity in the, in the disease. There are a number of consensus and guidelines. I showed you some, some of the advice of this uh, group of, of experts. Uh, clearly, the main point for a, a, a clinical care is airway clearance. Uh, inhaled antibiotics and macrolide may be part of the, of, the, of the game. And certainly, patient risk assessment is very important to classify the patient, uh, to identify the patient that should be treated for in, in different way. And certainly, we need a number of data Registry are very important. Uh, Embark, I think, is one of the main uh, registry and is very is giving us a lot of information about uh, the uh, uh, role of, of, uh, of different uh, risk factor in bronchitis patient. Data sharing is important. We have to work together to improve the, the management of our patient. On the other side, the biological heterogeneity is clear. Is clear. Endotypes are different. We have uh, eosinophil, we have neutrophil, and probably we need better biomarkers to identify the patient where, uh, for example, inhaled steroids may be useful 
and in 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 and when the the enhanced steroids may be harmful for our patient, so we need clearly high quality clinical data uh, to reach the precision medicine we all want for our patient, and uh, try to understand how drugs works and how the uh, trans, uh, translational research can be a, in some way uh, used in, uh, uh, in in clinical trials. And uh, clearly, biobanks are important. Uh, we have Ember Bridge is an important uh, program for uh, giving new information. And clearly, international collaboration is important because we want to develop new therapies and targets for our patient, uh, trying to have biomarker and uh, correctly endotyping our patient to have good phase three clinical trial and improvement in uh, clinical practice for our patient. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we have some questions. The uh, first question is for uh, Professor Chalmers. And that is, what is it about Pseudomonas specifically compared to other types of bacterial infections that make it so much worse in terms of patient outcomes? That's a really great question. So um, there's what we know and what we don't know. So there are some things that we know about Pseudomonas that make it worse. So um, it's, a, it's a highly pro-inflammatory bacteria. If you look at the airway inflammation in a patient with Pseudomonas, even for the same amount of bacteria, the same bacterial load, the amount of inflammation is much higher. And that's probably to do with the characteristics of the bacteria uh, in terms of its LPS and how it interacts with the immune system. But the other thing that makes it particularly difficult is it's intrinsically resistant to most oral antibiotic options. And so that makes it very difficult to treat. <laughs> and it's very adept at forming biofilms. That means it's very persistent. And so even if you give an effective antibiotic, it's able to come back very, very quickly after antibiotics are stopped. So those are the things that we, we know, but there are also things that we don't know about why it is just so, so bad in terms of its uh, role in disease progression. Um, and that's why we need what Francesco described really brilliantly in that final, final slide, which is more translational research to understand, you know, what is it about these patients and their susceptibility to this infection that means that we struggle so much to manage them? Uh, it's not just the factors that I mentioned. There are definitely other factors at play that we need to get to the bottom of. Um, but I think that those, those three things, antibiotic resistance, biofilm formation, and the inflammatory load are probably a big part of it. And as a related question to that, Professor Chalmers, how often should of bronchiectasis patients be screened for PSA infection? So I think it depends a little bit on the severity of the patients. And here, I have no guideline I can point you to. I'm not aware of any guideline that says how often bronchiectasis patients should be screened. So I tell you what I do, which is I ask all of my patients to do sputum at least once a year. Uh, and if they're mild and they're not having frequent exacerbations, that might be as often as they need to have sputum done. Patients that are more severe, I ask them to do it every three months, which is what we recommend in cystic fibrosis. Um, and also I give patients sputum pots to take away so that when they have an exacerbation, they can take a sputum sample to their family doctor uh, in order to, to know what's causing that exacerbation. Uh, and so I think that personalized approach is the way to do it because if you ask every patient to do it every three months, that's gonna be overkill for patients who have well-controlled disease. But in people with severe disease, it's important that you get regular sputum cultures to guide antibiotic treatment. Professor Blasi, a couple questions for you. Uh, why doesn't antibiotic reduction in bacterial load always translate to symptom improvements? Well, I think it's, I don't know if there is a, a clear <laughs> implication of reducing load and improving the symptoms. Uh, but uh, for sure, when you reduce inflammation, uh, probably you have some effects in, in terms of symptoms. Uh, I don't think that there is uh, any, any uh, good paper looking to uh, the strict correlation between the load of bacteria and the, uh, the symptoms. However, what we know is that if we reduce the load of bacteria, it, usually you improve the symptoms, probably because we reduce the infl inflammatory response in the eyeway. Hey, thank you. Uh, next question is, do you think microbiomics will 
eventually become part of practice in screening bronchiectasis patients, or is, will it primarily remain as a research tool? Well, I think it, it's, it's quite complicated to have a, a good microbiome study first. So you, uh, I think that in the world, there are only few few groups that can give you real good data on microbiome, uh, including, you know, all the, you know, fungi, virus, and so on. Uh, on the other side, uh, uh, I, I I think that in the in the next future, uh, the, the microbiome studies will become important for uh, the personalized medicine because if the, the data we, we publish uh, are, are true, uh, at the end of the day, knowing what are in the airway, what, what what kind of flora is present in the airways could be part of our uh, of our management of the patient. So uh, till now, it's not possible. It's just a research tool. But maybe in the next year, um, the, the microbiome studies can be part of our assessment of the patient. Thank you. It looks like that concludes our uh, questions that have been submitted. So at that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, a deep dive into the eyes of non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. For future reference, today's webinar will be posted to the ATS YouTube channel in approximately two weeks. On behalf of Zambone USA LTD and our faculty, thank you for joining us today. We hope you found the program useful and informative.